Hello and welcome to the Healthy Home Show. My name is Richard Mullen and I'm your host for this series. And our goal, each session we'd like to do is just inform you something different about the house that you can do better and make your house a little more healthier, safer, and uh, to save some money too. Uh, we have, I'm a certified mold inspector and moisture inspector. Uh, also do roof assessments. And I'm an indoor quality, indoor air quality specialist. But I have a specialist here today who is from the Green Cocoon. And my guest for today is Candace Lord. And Candace, I want to find out all about you. Oh, well. Um, so, yeah, um, I am the vice president of the Green Cocoon. Uh, we are based out of Salisbury, Massachusetts, and we serve um, southern Maine, all the North Shore, yeah, and down to the Cape. Uh, we've been in business for a little over 17 years now, wow. and uh, we focus on uh, insulation, air sealing, uh, weatherization, uh, to make people's homes more efficient and safer. Um, we are actually one of the only companies, uh, insulation companies in New England that has an SPFA accreditation. Mm -hmm. um, so our industry is unlicensed and unregulated. So um, anybody can buy a truck and do insulation, which is... We were talking about him, chucking a truck. Yeah, chucking a truck. It's <laughs> kind of scary because ultimately, especially when dealing with spray foam, it's plastics manufacturing. So really, uh -huh. you want to make sure that you're picking a, a, a credible company. Um, but we're, we have um, master certified installers, uh, certified project managers. I myself am um, a BPI envelope analyst, so I am considered a, a, a building science expert. Okay. Um, and yeah, we just we do small projects to large new construction renovations. Um, and then just the, the typical homeowner that wants to improve their attic insulation or their basement insulation. Um, so, yeah. And you mentioned a, um, an acronym or, or a, what was the SPCA? Is S it? SPFA is oh, our was the national thing. accrediting organization. Okay. Um, it's the only like large third party organization that we have as an industry that isn't a manufacturer. So you can also get certifications through spray foam manufacturers, but it's definitely not as in-depth um, in, in terms of the building science requirement. Okay. Um, so the SPFA stands for the Spray Polyurethane Foam Alliance, and you can go on to um, their website and search for contractors in your area that have these accreditations, and, and there are very few in this area, and we're lucky okay. um, to be one of them. Would there be a, what would be the sense of not having one of those? Accreditations. I mean, like you say that, I, I would think it would be helpful to a, a company to have it. But is the, is it difficult to get, or is it? Uh... It it is so. It, it, it is difficult in the sense that um, you have to have a lot of experience um, in order to be accredited as a company. You have to have two certified master installers, which is the third level out of four, and two certified project managers, which is like the fourth level. So you have to have enough people that have gone through the training, and then in order to be a certified master installer, you have to have you know, half a million board feet of spraying experience. Mm -hmm. um, they check your accreditations with the Better Business Bureau. They check references. Um, you know, they, they want recommendations from your suppliers. So they're really vetting you as a company to make sure that you have all your ducks in a row and that you have been doing the right thing. And then, again, we fly out to the convention every year this year. It's in Vegas, which is exciting. Ooh. So I'll be there next month actually teaching some of the breakout sessions at the convention. Oh, okay. So, yeah, they, oh, that's great. We, we fly out there, and you have week-long trainings. There's um, um, field training, and then there are tests. You know, the tests are a few hours apiece, and there's four of them, and you have to get a pretty high number to pass. So. Okay. Well, you know, when I think of, you know, even 20 years ago, this field was pretty wide open. It was the wild, wild west, and somebody could call up, and uh, people had a bunch of bags in the back of their truck, and they'd go in the house, and they'd do whatever they do, hide everything, and leave. But from what you're telling me now, that's not happening in the industry anymore. There's some professionalism? We're getting there. Mm -hmm. It's still sort of the wild, wild west because of the fact that there is no accreditation. And And again, like I said, with... With any insulation at all, this is really building science heavy. This mm -hmm. isn't just, 
oh, what's the code requirement for our value? Yeah, okay, we'll just blow that much in and it's fine. There's mm. a lot to think about sure. in terms of moisture and airflow and potential risks. And um, so it's building science heavy. So if you were a contractor or worked in the trades and you said, you know, I'm going to start an insulation company and you just buy the equipment and go out and try it out, you, you know, there you can cause a lot of damage. Mm. So it, I'm working with our national organization and with a great group of people that are trying to push for legislation to try to require licensing for this industry, just like hiring a licensed electrician or a licensed plumber or a licensed home builder. Mm -hmm. when, when you're spraying foam, you are manufacturing a plastic on site, and I feel like there definitely should be some requirements and, and a particular skill set before you start doing that in people's homes. Well, I don't think homeowners realize the potential damage that can happen by a bad insulation job. And what I'm what I want to find out from you is with this new foam system and uh, there's open cell and closed cell, mm -hmm. this can't go in every home because you can't have soffits and you can't have roof uh, uh, ridge vent. Is that correct? You have to be closed totally in the attic. It can go in any home. Okay. We just have to deal with closing off the ventilation which is pretty straightforward for us to do. So we can accommodate pretty much anything. And then once, let's say you take, right, right now most houses are um, insulation on the floor, mm -hmm. and then they have soffit vents and a roof ridge vent. We're hoping they do, because some people don't. Some don't, <laughs> right. and, But most of them don't know it, so they, right. they feel comfortable. But um, this here system... And what I'm wondering about, how does the ventilation take place? You have heat coming up from the living quarters, mm -hmm. and then uh, where does the air go? If you, have a, if you have an unvented roof system? Yeah, well, if you, if you took and put the foam in, like you... you On guys, the roof line. Yeah, you, yeah, so this kind of, we have to kind of go back a step and say, why do we ventilate an attic? What is the history of ventilation like? Mm -hmm. And the reason we ventilate an attic is because, specifically in this climate zone, the winter months can really cause a lot of condensation in the attic. So when you have heat that's rising, with that heat comes moisture. Mm -hmm. And so if the roof deck is cold in the winter, and that warm, moist air gets through the insulation, and then it hits the roof deck, it condenses. So now we have frost, now we have dripping, now we could grow mold. Grow mold. So the reason you have that ventilation is to pull the moisture out and allow for drying before it has a chance to either condense or to stay wet long enough to grow mold. So we needed ventilation because we historically have had improper and ineffective insulation. So when you insulate the roof line to the proper R value, we're thinking about, you know, five to seven inches of, of foam if we're doing all closed cell, then any air that gets into the attic, any moisture that gets into the attic is just ambient moisture, just like in the rest of the house. So if it gets into the attic, the interior surface of that foam will never be cold enough for there to be any condensation. So if you had 50% relative humidity in your house and 50% relative humidity in the attic, it's not a problem. Okay, zero, zero. Okay. Yeah, because you, just like you wouldn't worry about that moisture condensing on your walls or any other surface in your home, the attic is now part of your envelope, the thermal envelope of the house, so we don't have to worry about that condensation. So when you do an assessment, uh, have you come across uh, types, I'm thinking of some homes, some of the older homes were uh, very inexpensively made with two-by-fours, um, I don't see them being uh, a candidate for this uh, spray foam. For for the attic? Yeah. Yeah, no, you can. Uh, the framing, unless you have a cathedral and, and you have some kind of depth requirement where you're going to mm -hmm. finish it, any unfinished attic, we can spray any depth we want because even if we come past the face of the rafters and we bury all the rafters, that's actually a good thing because that reduces thermal bridging. Mm -hmm. yeah. is, there, is there anything when you, you capture... Um, Let's say when you go into places and you find you find mold uh, on the sheathing, mm -hmm. what do you do in that case? So then I would recommend a mold remediation company, okay. and they would need to have remediation done, and we would need to make sure that the surface is is mold free and dry, because spray foam is v is very sensitive to moisture and to temperature. So uh, we can't spray onto a dry surface. We need to make sure we have good adhesion. So I I we have a. You know, a lot of mold remediation companies in the back pocket we can recommend to people depending on where they are. Is And I know it's difficult, to, and I'm not asking for prices, but the difference between uh, spray foam 
and insulation on the on the floor of the like attic. a fiberglass or a cellulose yeah, or a blown in the yeah. yeah what's is there much of a difference there's a huge difference but it's like comparing apples to oranges mm -hmm. because you're not getting the same performance from fiberglass or from cellulose that you are getting from spray foam um it all comes, everybody focuses too much on R value. What's the R value? Well, I blew R49 of cellulose in my attic, so I'm mm -hmm. insulated enough. But what people don't understand is that R value, the R stands for resistance. It's a material's resistance to heat transfer, mm -hmm. how well it can stop heat transfer. Um, it's measured in a vacuum chamber. So that vacuum chamber is tight on all six sides. There's no air movement. It's perfect conditions. Mm -hmm. How well does that material stop? heat loss or heat transfer. In the real world, in our attics, that's not a vacuum chamber. You have ventilation coming over the top of it. You have ceiling penetrations. You have the top plates of the walls that aren't air sealed. You have a lot of moving air in that attic. So if you have an insulation material like fiberglass or cellulose, the R value is not effective anymore. There's a difference between a prescribed R value and then an effective R value of a material. The beautiful thing about foam is that whatever the R value is in the beginning, that's how it's also going to perform because it's the only insulation material that is an air vapor and thermal barrier all in one. So sure, could you do something cheaper? Sure, absolutely. There's cheaper things than spray foam, but are you gonna get what you're paying for? Absolutely not. What's the life expectancy of a spray foam? Longer than the homeowner. So over 30 years. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, so a typical, a well-done roof, somebody who really puts a roof together and does it well, it's about a 30-year life expectancy. Of the roof, the spray foam will be yeah. there indefinitely. All right. And it doesn't shrink? No. Nope. No. Nope. How does when it installed correctly. That's the big okay. thing. It's got to be installed properly. So uh, it, this probably wouldn't be a good job for a Chuck and his truck. No, and, and this is one of why I love the opportunity to speak to homeowners and to educate them about what the difference is because our, our, these materials get a bad rap. And every, you know, they, oh, spray foam is dangerous, or spray foam does this, spray foam does that, but it, it, it doesn't when it's installed properly. Just, I, I love the, the analogy of if I do the brakes in your car, you're probably going to get in an accident, but I wouldn't mm -hmm. go out there and say, don't, don't have brakes. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to have somebody that's qualified, that understands what they're doing, that's testing the, the surface temperatures and, and, and moisture before they start. Somebody that, that understands what the problems might be, that can see something, an issue before it happens, um, and then you can guarantee that you're going to get a good job. And I guess for me, the reason I wanted to find out more about spray foam is it, it seems to be an advantage, if what I think is factual, to control mold. Because Absolutely. Because every place I go, every time I go into an attic and I pop my head up and I can see it, and I can see it from outside before I go in the house, I know what's going on. But when I pop up and I see the sheet in this mold, right above me is mold because they pull down stairs, uninsulated. Not air sealed. So this this takes away from, do you, do you have to do air sealing plus spray foam? Nope. Spray foam okay. is the okay, air that, seal. So, yep. that, so people don't lose then the use of their attic. Nope. And actually then if you, do, if you store things in your attic, mm -hmm. if you have insulation on the attic floor and then you're storing things in the attic, they get damaged. The, the temperature fluctuations, so, yeah. the humidity, the dryness, the insects. So if you're storing things in your attic that you care about and that you want to keep for a long time, having a conditioned attic, which is what we're doing when we insulate the roof line, having a conditioned attic is, a, is the way to go. Okay. No, that sounds... Uh, because that's one of the things. And the other side is all of those things that get covered up by... My concern is things get covered up by insulation. When people go in and just... Uh, they don't clean the attic or they don't check the um, <clears throat> the connections. I don't know how many times I've gone into an attic and I've seen open boxes, a loose wire just sitting there, you know, electrical wire coming out of a box, and uh, and also the vent fans. So that that's yeah. my big... Now, how does somebody, if they want to vent anything into the attic, so let's say we want to send a, uh, uh, a plumbing duct up into the uh, vent, can we go through the foam? Yeah, so you want to have that done before. So if okay. we, when I when I go into an attic and I'm assessing, I look for attic vents, and I look for uh, like bathroom vents, uh, kitchen vents, anything that's vented into the attic. 
Now, really, they shouldn't be venting into the attic. That is a no-no. So if you have something that's just ending at a soffit or you just have a hose lying there and people think, oh, well, that's fine because I have ventilation and it's going to pull it away, you do not have enough ventilation to account for the moisture that comes through one of these yeah. bathroom vents. So um, really, we recommend that they have a handyman or, or a contractor come in and vent it through the roof. You want to hard pipe it straight through the roof okay. and get that done prior. Then we would come in and spray and and spray it into place. So when, when you go in, this is the information you'd get people say before, you know, you'd tell them before. Like, yeah. I know, uh, I, I've seen contractors who all they want to do is do the job, get it over and get paid. And they don't care what's underneath it because they can hide all that stuff and throw it in. So that that's good. I like to see the professionalism uh, and I like to see the fact that somebody's got the lifetime of a house. Uh, that's not a problem. Do you, what, what do you think is the the, probably the thing that you see the most that gets you the most concerned when you go into an attic. Is there anything that you just think off the top of your head when you're doing a um, an estimate? I'm, my my mind always goes to I cannot imagine how much fuel they're using. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go in and it's it's. 40 year old compressed fiberglass yeah. it's upside down the craft papers up there's uh -huh. you know through the years that contractors have gone in to fix this fix the hvac and they move some insulation they never put it back and you know when i talk to the homeowner they say oh well the inspector said it's fine or oh it's been fine mm. we've had it for years there's plenty up there um that's always a concern for me because ultimately we're in business to save the planet we're in business to reduce mm carbon footprint to reduce fossil fuel usage and to make homes more efficient. So that's what I see. And the second thing that always concerns me is improper ventilation, not having enough ventilation, mm -hmm. having, you know, someone went in there and blew three feet of cellulose in an attic and it's just right mm -hmm. up against the roof deck, which is not code compliant. Mm -hmm. So you can't just blow insulation into an attic. There are steps that have to be taken beforehand. So usually it comes down to not having enough insulation or, or, you know, having things that could cause moisture problems. Okay, yeah, and I think that that's good. When you and so when you do a, an estimate, or do you estimates or quotes? I always I make the difference between the two. Estimates, quotes, proposals, this, yeah. whatever a, you want to call it. At least the quote is is to me is a firm number. Yeah. And not an ideal number on the other side. But when you do a quote, um, do you make you, you're going to make a series of recommendations prior to you folks arriving, and you usually think that the uh, and I find people have struggles to understand it, um, why something would cost so much. Mm -hmm. uh, but then again, when I say it's like a roof, you can get a really inexpensive roof and change it in 10 years. Or you can get a really good roof and forget it. You don't have to think about it. Yeah, so, cheap is expensive long term. Right, in the long term. And we try to get uh, our customers to understand the importance of thinking bigger picture and longer term because you can always find something cheaper right now but that cheap is going to cost you much more down the line because you're either going to have to do it again in a few years or it's going to potentially cause mold problems ice dams are a really expensive cost for a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, so yeah definitely spend more up front you'll thank yourself later how long does it take you to give uh, when you go to a house uh, to give an estimate or a, a quote it depends on how chatty I get with the customer Mm -hmm. But uh, honestly, I mean, if I if I am in a standard attic, colonial, a line roof, I mean, five five or ten minutes, it doesn't take long to mm -hmm. see. I've been doing this for twelve years. I've been in attics daily for twelve years, mm -hmm. so I know what to look for. I I measure quick, and then I chat with the customer about what their options are. Okay, so it doesn't take too long. It doesn't take long at all. And I do you, and and I do this because this is. This exists in this industry, and I'm, I'm not comfortable with it, but a lot of contractors will go and they try to get people to sign on the dotted line immediately uh -uh. because we get a special price. No. And if you sign now, you're going to get the special price. There's no special price. <laughs> we don't have special contractor prices. We don't have all if I pay you cash. <laughs> my, my price is my price for everybody. We try to be fair, um, and we don't. there's very low pressure. This okay, is, good. you know, we, we try to turn uh, uh, proposals around within, you know, 24 to 48 hours at most. Mm -hmm. uh, we follow up, but we don't, you know, if you want to do the work, we're happy to do it for you, but there is absolutely no pressure to do the work. Okay, good. And I think that's important to all the people I talk to because they've, they've been stuck in a situation where they, 
they're polite, they're nice people, and they don't know how to get rid of someone because their system is to stay until they weigh you down. We're as we're the least amount of salesy that you can be okay. because I'm not in sales. I don't have to sell you my product. If you call me, it's because you already are interested in it. It's not like I knocked on your door and said, hey, do you want some spray foam? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't have to sell you anything. I'm here to solve a problem. You have a problem or a concern, and I'm here to solve it for you. So I actually, we, we thought about that at one point, bringing a tablet. Let's just do the proposal there. We can answer questions quickly. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that does pressure people, and that's not what we're about. So we just, we'll check your email in a day or two. Yeah, good. I, I like that, too, because I, overall, all the people I've talked to, the majority of people, they just want to have a little time to sit down and say, is this X number of dollars we're going to spend? And you, know, and you know what it is? If you're honest and you're straightforward, that's what people really want. Mm -hmm. It's not so much about the price. Yeah. They want to know, is this person really going to do the job for me? Is it going to be, uh, you know, is it going to be something that's going to last for the rest of my life like they say? Mm -hmm. But uh, the, Because I guess what I'm... I'm really concerned about addicts is because, like we said, people don't go up there, yep. and they don't see them. And I, you know, and it's like we talked a little bit about knob and tube. I've been in addicts where people have been told by their electrician that it's fine to have knob and tube. You want to put insulation in. This thing is all set. And I think we talked about did the electrician sign off on that? Mm -hmm. No, he didn't. But. Uh, What's your thought on knob and tube when you're doing insulation? Um, if there's remnants of knob and tube but not actual wiring, that's okay. Yeah. Um, if the knob and tube is wired, we would require that they have it signed off okay. uh, by an electrician. If you're an electrician and you say, oh, yeah, it's fine, but you're not willing to sign off on it, that's that's, that's something a, you want to question. Red, red flag. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, red flag. The, uh... Yeah, we don't want to cause any fires. No. We're here to help, not okay, cause good. problems, right? So especially if we're doing an attic floor, if we're doing the roof line, it's not as much of a concern because we're not really messing with the attic floor too much. But think about the crews. What if the crews touch something as they're walking sure. across the joist? You know, we want to keep our guys safe. It's not just about, you know, is the house in danger, but my crews. I care about my guys, and we want to make sure that they're safe. So those are things that we would look out for beforehand. So here's what I what I what I like about as much as I know about the spray and foam is that you can actually take and create an attic floor, so you actually have a, a real viable space, and you can clean it and keep it clean because the attics I see is uh, they're a source of uh, dust, mold, pollen, everything you know, rodents, li little crawling things, yeah, and rodents running around, and I, I think if you can access that and have a way to keep that clean. And, uh, I mean, that's the ideal thing. So I'm kind of getting um, a little bit excited about this foam thing because now I can, because I really do want to recommend things. I, I, I do make a lot of recommendations to people so that they can stop and, and solve their problem rather than put it off. Yeah, and foam is wonderful, and we recommend foam very regularly, especially if there's HVAC equipment in the attic. Mm -hmm. That's one of the number one reasons you want to foam your roof line is because that HVAC is always in the wrong temperature. It's mm -hmm. trying to create and maintain cold air from 140 degrees and then it's trying to create heat and pump it through these long ducts and the whole time it's losing heat because the attic is, you know, 20 degrees. So when you condition the attic, you improve the efficiency of the equipment. It lasts longer. It doesn't kick on as often. So your electric bill is lower. So, but if you have nothing in the attic, you have a little scuttle, you don't have a pull down stair, you're not using it for storage. We don't always recommend foam. There's other really great things you can do. Mm -hmm. But again, you still have to understand the building science behind it, what you're doing and what needs to be in place before you do that. No. Okay. That's really good. Yeah. Cause I think there's, there's always going to be two options or three options and, mm -hmm. Uh, I think the uh, homeowner should be getting the best possible option uh, that they can ever have. So I want to make sure we get everything here. Uh, is there a preference? Now, I, I think your preference is blown in, but you are, and I think you did just say to me that you would go in and you'd look at an attic and then make um, a decision as to what to suggest. So you might want to put bats in, uh, blown insulation. Yeah, we won't put bats in an attic. If okay, you, you want won't. fiberglass, I am not your girl. Good. I'm not your girl. Because <laughs> when, when I hear fiberglass, you know what I see? Fiberglass in the air, 
floating around in, the, in yeah. the, the light coming through and just hitting it. It's a measurable contaminant. Yeah. Fiberglass, I mean, if you're, if you're concerned about indoor air quality, you do not want fiberglass. Mm -hmm. And also the number one thing we see with fiberglass, besides the fact that it grows mold, mm -hmm. is that it, it's like rodents number one nesting material they love this stuff we see day in and day out in basement ceilings in attic floors just little holes tons of tunnels droppings they they love this stuff so when you put fiberglass into your attic you are literally giving rodents a very comfortable place to stay so we we won't do it we'll do cellulose instead which is treated with the boric acid which is a pest repellent mm -hmm. um and it's a similar price to fiberglass so why wouldn't you want something that okay, okay. that would repel the rodents and, and i think people still i think uh, do it yourself uh are still going out and buying rolls of uh, fiberglass but i i do try to from the indoor air quality i tried to help people especially if there's someone in the house with um, asthma or there's an older person or an infant just that it, it's in your air i mean it's coming it, it comes around, it gets down the cellar, it comes back, it goes all over Especially the place. if you have can lights, mm. if you have vents, duct, you know, duct vents in the ceiling, yeah. if you have any kind of penetrations or open areas between your attic and your house, you all that stuff is coming in. Now, with all of your experience, um, is there anything new coming up uh, in the idea of insulation, uh, attics, and quickly, do you do anything in basements? Yeah, basements, we insulate basements all the time. Um, the basement ceiling, again, we like to do anything other than fiberglass. Mineral wool is a great product for basement ceilings. We also do a lot of spray foam in basement ceilings. Um, but particularly with basement walls, if, if you're a homeowner and you want to finish off your basement and you frame up the basement walls and you say, I'm just going to throw some fiberglass bats in there, you're going to have mold very quickly, mm -hmm. especially if you're putting in fiberglass with like a poly film over it. That plastic mm -hmm. is a moisture trap okay. and you always have some kind of sweating through that concrete and the fiberglass just wicks the moisture off the concrete. It absorbs all that moisture and then it can't dry out. So it sits against between the poly and the fiberglass. So we love, love, love spray foam on basement foundation walls and we can even spray on like fieldstone foundations, old basements. And is it, will it stay? I mean, and how, how does the water react to it? Like the moisture coming through a field stone, for example. It, it's well, always going to come through a field stone. It's yeah. always going to come through. Generally, the, the foam will plug a lot of those larger areas. Okay. But uh, foam is a, can be used as a drain plane. So a lot of times what we want to do is tie in the foam to like a perimeter drain or a French drain so that any water that does come through, it? it drains right into their French drain. Oh, that's really And we good. do that with new construction all the time. They build in a French drain, mm -hmm. they insulate the walls right over the drain, yeah. and then you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, it would seem to me new construction, this would be a, a no-brainer. Yeah. And, and, and why would anybody want to do anything else? The, uh, but I, I do see there's a whole segment that we could do on uh, on basements because people have in trouble. All the houses, 60, 70 years old, cinder block, cement block, and uh, granite stone. Well, if you got a way to protect that, that's a, and you say you do. Oh, we do, yeah. And and with crawl spaces, especially not a basement, but something that's a little yeah. more inaccessible, we can insulate the walls and the floor right up over the sill plates and create what we call like a bathtub, and that keeps all the moisture out, all you know, prevents mold, keeps rodents out, and then now you have nice, warm, toasty floors instead of having a, a okay. damp and cold floor underneath. All right. Wow. Look at it. It's almost time to go. We've been having so much fun. Uh, that went really Ken. fast. I, I, I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was interested in what you were saying. It was pretty cool. Yeah. So, anyhow, we're getting down to the uh, the last of this, and I want to thank everybody for being here. I'm sorry we went over, and uh, I'll, I'll apologize to the BevCam people. And Candace from Green Cocoon, I'm glad you were here. Yeah, thank thanks for much. having me. I appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, I guess we're off the air. Uh, and cut. Isn't that something how fast that goes? Holy